All right, so welcome back to Scottish Music. So um, today we are very privileged to have uh, Simon Tadwick here to talk to you. Um, he is uh, all the way from St Andrews, as it happens, um, and uh, has worked in his reconstruction of the marriage, the Queen Mary Harp. So I'll let you hear Simon on the harp. Thank you. And that's it. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about the Clarsach and the harp more generally in Scotland, but it's terribly complicated and difficult and there's lots of different strands. It's an incredibly diverse subject and it's quite hard to stitch all the different aspects together. So we might only uh, end up concentrating on some aspects of it, but I'll try and flag up where there are side lines that are different or that you can trace up. So we're going to start with an anecdote. This is Macintosh's collection of Gaelic proverbs. And Macintosh was in the late 18th century he was writing. And he, and he t writes down an anecdote that he got from his father. And this anecdote would date to the 1720s, I would guess. He says, one night my father, James Macintosh, said to Lude that he would be happy to hear him play upon the harp, which, at that time, began to give place to the violin. After supper, Lude and James Mackintosh retired to another room, in which there were a couple of harps, one of which belongs to Queen Mary. James, says Lude, here are two harps. The largest one is the loudest but the small one is the sweetest. Which do you wish to hear played? James answered, the small one, which Jude took up and played upon it till daylight. And so this is in Jude House, which is by Blair Athol in Perthshire. And James Robertson of Jude had two ancient harps in the house, and he was the last person to play on them, and so he was right at the end of the old indigenous harp playing tradition in Scotland. And this thing here is my archaeological reconstruction of the smaller of his two harps, the smaller and sweeter one called Queen Mary's harp. Now, um, Mackintosh also explains that he himself went up to Blair Athol and he visited Lude House and he saw the two harps there, but they weren't in, in playing condition at that time and there was no need to play them. But he thought this would be the late 18th century or the beginning of the 19th century. He thought they were fascinating archaeological specimens. And so he told the Highland Society in Edinburgh about them. And they wrote to Lude and got the two harps sent down to Edinburgh to be exhibited as specimens. He says, um, the musical instruments of our ancestors, as well as those of the renowned heroes of Ossian, so there's a lot of excitement about this. And this book was published out of that trip that the Harps made, their little holiday to Edinburgh where they were exhibited and John Gunn, who was a musician in town, um, inspected them and measured them and had drawings made of them that he published. And so this, this is the front of the book, and you can see this is his engraving of the Queen Mary harp. And the, this was quite an important piece of organological work. Um, and so this is Gunn's book. This is a, my photocopy of it. And as well as describing the harps, it descri it, he does a whole historical inquiry as to the use of the harp in the highlands of Scotland. Because he was interested to try and work out what are these objects, what's their connection to Perthshire and Blair Athol. And the book is really interesting for how it goes about this, because all the way through his analysis, there's this questioning, are these Scottish harps? Because it's not obvious at that time. Um, the, the instant association of the harp was with Ireland, and so he, he, he does quite a lot of discussion in the book about trying to prove that these are not Irish harps. Um, the other question is that they, if they belong to Mary, Queen of Scots, does that mean they're French harps? And so again, he goes through the book trying to prove that they're not French harps. And I find this very interesting, that there doesn't 
he doesn't seem it doesn't seem to be obvious to him that they're Scottish Harps. He has to try and argue it. And then he gives also a lot of information from the family. And these this is in the form of letters that were sent down to the Highland Society by the family, telling their family history. And the letters are all lost because there was a fire in the Highland Society archives. So all we have is his paraphrase of them, which is a great shame. And he says, the last of the family of Lude who played on Queen Mary's harp before it was despoiled of its valuable ornaments by the soldiers in 1745, so the last to play on it was the great-grandfather of the current Robertson of Lude. The music which he played upon it consisted chiefly of the airs which had been composed by the Highland bards on some remarkable occasion, laments in commemoration of deceased persons of eminence, of the airs <coughs> called Purchts, and of marches of the Highland clans. None of these have been preserved in the family except Lude's Supper, like a family salute. And then he explained that the father of the current Mr. Robertson had heard um, the great-grandfather playing the music on the Queen Mary harp. And so it was in his ear. And he says, he used to play a great number of them on the violin. And from him, his son learned by ear to play them on the violin. And some of these were taken down in writing from his performance by Bowie, a music seller in Perth, and were published about 12 years ago, at the end of his collection of reels. Here's the two harps side by side in Gunn's book. Oh, I'm skipping ahead of myself, aren't they? Here, here they are. I'll come back to these because of what I want to do. is get to, this is Barry's collection of reels. Okay. And, so, and so I was very interested to make this connection between, between what Gunn tells us from the family story and the actual book. He says the following pieces of ancient music were furnished to the editor by a gentleman of note in the Highlands of Scotland, were composed originally for the harp and were handed down to him by his ancestors who learned the same with the famous Rory Dahl, the celebrated harper. And so we have these, this selection of tunes that are published in Barry's fiddle book that, according to Gunn, come from the playing of the last of the Robertsons of Lude on the harp. And so I thought I should play you one of these on the replica of Queen Mary's harp, just so that you can get a sense of what kind of thing James Mackintosh would have heard in the 1720s and he went up there and visited Jude. So I'll play you this one that's at the top right hand corner, MacLeod Salute, which is a version of this tune Lude Supper that's like the family anthem. Mm -hmm. 
let's go back a bit and say a little a little word about about the instruments. So this is this is Gunn's book, and he illustrates them both. Okay. And here they both are just a few years ago. So they're both kept now in the National Museum in Edinburgh. And so because they're in the National Museum, because they have had these strong associations since Gunn published his book on them, they've been in national consciousness as iconic ancient objects. And so, and so they've had a big effect on perceptions of the heart in Scotland. And so you can go into Edinburgh now, you can look at them. You can't see them side by side like this. This is the only photo that I've ever seen of them together. This is when Karen Loomis was doing her PhD work on them, and she had to make a special effort to line them up. And, to, and you can see that my replica of the one on the left was done to be as accurate as possible. So, the, so that you can see it in working order, because these are very ancient. They're... they're probably late medieval in date. The Queen Mary has recently been radiocarbon dated, but the results aren't out yet. So uh, within the next few months, we should have calendar dates for when trees were cut down that it was made from. So they're quite small as harps go. They're incredibly complicated and decorated. <coughs> and so you can see how they have this kind of miasma of oceanic medieval law that instantly attaches to them. Okay. So Gunn explains what happens. So they had so they had the Queen Mary harp in Edinburgh to be exhibited, and they thought, well, that's all very well but let's get it going. So he says, it seems to, the general, to be the general wish of the members of the society to have it strung with brass wire, which had been for many centuries the strings used by the Irish and Highland harpers, and it was accordingly at first strung in that manner. It did not, however, then occur to us that these harpers had a peculiar manner of producing the tone from brass strings by their nails, which they allowed to grow to a certain length and form for that purpose. The touch or manner of producing the vibration of the strings by modern performers is on a different principle altogether, and can only be done on strings made of the intestines of animals. This is really interesting. So they put brass strings on the original Queen Mary have, just like I have brass strings on my copy. And then they thought, nobody can play it, because there's nobody playing the harp with long fingernails to sound the brass strings in their old native tradition. And that's kind of interesting and significant. And he points out that all the modern performers use gut strings, and they use the tips of their fingers to play it. By the advice and under the direction of Mr. Eloi, the celebrated performer on the pedal harp, this instrument was therefore again fitted with other strings of guts. I heard him perform a number of different airs upon it in the presence of several members of the society and other gentlemen. So there's a, so there's a fascinating thing going on here that they can't get it working in the old indigenous tradition because there's nobody available who's able to play the harp in its original setup. And so they just take off all the metal strings and they put on it the Anglo-Continental system and they get a French or Swiss pedal harp man to string it and play on it. And so you have a kind of colonial imposition of the Anglo-Continental tradition onto the ancient Gallic object. This is Mr. Eloise's, one of his publications. So, so he was in Edinburgh for quite a few years. He was a professor of pedal harp. And he, this is at a time when the pedal harp was becoming fashionable. So the legacy of 
Marie Antoinette and the revival of the harp in France, and there was the technical improvements that turned it into a, a chromatic instrument with a pedal mechanism, and the whole development of classical style on the harp. And so this is the kind of harp that Eloise played, and this is the kind of music that he set for it. And he had lots of aristocratic ladies as his students, and it, one of the things that interests me a lot is, the, is this incredibly polite society, and yet Eloi seems to be a bit of a racy gentleman. So the first song in his book is Tibby Fowler. I don't know if you can read the words. Tibby Fowler on the Glen. There's oh, many winning at her. Uh, and, and it's basically winning at her, wooing at her, pawing at her, coming at her, can I get her, filthy elf. I mean, it's disgusting stuff. And this is what he would be giving to these, to these polite young ladies who are coming for a pedal heart lesson. And uh, I think there's some anecdotes about how he embarrassed himself and had to be sent away from home. So this is kind of a fun little aside. So, so this is the man who put the Anglo-Continental tradition of gut strings and tuning and everything onto Queen Mary's harp and played it for the gentlemen of the Highland Society as part of their archaeological or organological investigation of Queen Mary's harp. And I'm just fascinated by this kind of clash of cultures. So these are the kind of harps that Eloas played. Okay? And they were quite popular in early 19th century Scotland. So if you, if you wanted to play the harp in the early 19th century Scotland, this was basically it. Because as we've seen, there was nobody, there was nobody who knew how to play the medieval harps. There were only two ancient harps known, and they were both a viewed house. And so if you wanted to play the harp, you would send to London and you would get a pedal harp. And this is what Walter Scott did for his daughter, Sophia Lockhart. And so this is her, how, this is her harp on the right at Abbotsford. And you would use, she would be using a harp like this to play the kind of thing that Eloise published, these classical settings of Scott's song airs. So there are interesting issues here to do with um, Gaelic and Scots there are, the, there are different associations so Walter Scott uses the um, uses the figure of the harper as his minstrel in the lay of the last minstrel which is plugging into an English border ballad tradition of English travelling minstrels and yet at the same time you've got the idea of the, of the Gaelic bard Ossian who's the Highland or Irish Gaelic Harper, and these things are kind of undifferentiated, and they, they get horribly mixed up in lots of different ways. Here's another person playing a pedal harp, M Margaret MacLean for fame. She was um, she was an associate of Walter Scott. She fed him a lot of material about the Highlands. And so she lived on Mull, and she was a, a kind of song collector and folklorist. And so she collected Gaelic songs and music from the people on Mull and made classical style arrangements and performed them on pedal harp because that was the only kind of harp there was around. So she was kind of aware of the old harp traditions, but this was her way of understanding and expressing them. And on the right, is, the, is a, the kind of harp. You can see this is, a, this is one that's made by John Egan. And so the same thing's happening in Ireland. John Egan was a famous harp maker. He made pedal harps because that's the type of harp that there was demand for, that there was, that was available, that people knew how to play. John Egan was a, was a very interesting <coughs> inventor, and he had a lot to do with the development of the harp in this part of the world. So he, he was working in Dublin, and you can see on the left is his advertisement, and he says, his new improved portable Irish harp, strung with gut, in the Anglo-Continental tradition, capable of making as many changes of key as the pedal harp. 
So he's deliberately comparing his new invention as a kind of, as a kind of pedal harp substitute. Invented, manufactured and sold by John Egan, Dawson Street, Dublin. And on the right is a surviving example of one of these portable harps. And so it's basically a cut down and shrunk pedal harp. You can see at the top of the harp is the mechanism for changing keys. And instead of pedals at the bottom, because it, it only stands about this high, so it, so it doesn't reach your feet. So instead of pedals, it has these um, hand levers up the inside. But it's otherwise it's the same as a pedal harp. And it's designed to be the same as a pedal harp. And then a lady, an aristocratic lady who had learnt pedal harp from somebody like Mr. Eloise could take this new portable miniature and play all their classical arrangements of traditional song airs on it. And this was quite an interesting, innovative thing. It was quite influential on the development of perceptions of national music. You can't call it traditional music, and you can't call it classical music, because these are, these are very anachronistic concepts at this time. I think national music is how people would have thought about it then. So through the 19th century, that was kind of the way that harping was expressed in Scotland and Ireland. And I'm not, at the moment, I'm not sure how much backwards and forwards there was. Earlier, there'd been a lot of backwards and forwards because they were part of the old Gallic world, this continuum, the North Channel being a much easier way for culture to pass. Um, but in the 19th century, I don't know how much contact there was between Scottish and Irish harp people. By the end of the 1890s, you've got a, a quite a different thing going on. So pedal harp is, is less, a lot less common. So there's, there's less of a practice of harp playing in Scotland and in Ireland. But what there was happening at that time, first of all, there was um, archaeological awareness because the Queen Mary harp had once again come to Edinburgh. And by, by the 1890s, it was on dis permanent display in the museum. You also have the Gaelic revival in both Ireland and Scotland. You have an awareness of Celtic culture and a big uprising in attempts to have revivals. So you have the Gaelic choir, and this is the start of the mod. So this all kicked off in about 1890, 1891. And so you can see these are the members of the Oban Gaelic choir. And on the far left hand there we have a man with the bagpipes. I don't know if he would play while the choir sang, maybe. And on the right, at the front, you have a lady with a harp. And you can see that her harp is very different from the ones we've been looking at, very different from Sophia Lockhart's or Margaret McLean Clefane's pedal harps. She ha they haven't sent to London for a, a new Anglo-European style instrument. What they've done is they've commissioned brand new archaeological replicas of the medieval harps, just like what I've got here. Okay. So her harp is just like mine, it has metal wire strings set up as a medieval instrument. Okay. However, the way she's holding it with her right hand high and her left hand low is the Anglo-classical orientation and style. So, there's, so you can see that there's aspects of historical revival and aspects of continuing Anglo-continental tradition kind of going on here. It's like a fusion. And a thing... Yeah, so... <coughs> here we are at the Oban Mod in 1892. And, and here's, a, here's Kate MacDonald with one of these instruments. I never actually thought who the lady in the last photo was. It might be Kate MacDonald. I don't know. I don't have any information <coughs> about it. Anyway, here she is. And then on the right is a photograph of one of these instruments that turned up recently in an auction house. So they were made by Glenn, the Edinburgh instrument makers, and they're pretty close copies of the medieval harps in the museums. But you'll see the way Kate MacDonald is holding her harp. She's holding it much higher up. This is an Anglo-Continental pedal harp thing. She's holding it, which she's playing the treble with her right hand and her bass with her left hand, which again is the Anglo-Continental orientation, whereas the old native orientation is to have the left hand in the treble right hand in the bass and the whole instrument lower. And there are many other differences in the playing traditions, but these are the most obvious and visual. So when you see somebody playing a harp, you can instantly <coughs> tell whether they're in the old native tradition or the 
in the continental tradition by which way around they're holding it. This is a photograph from the Illustrated London News. Here's my cutting of it. And Lord Archibald Campbell, who was the instigator of the revival and the development of the mod, wrote a big article about this open mod in 1892. And he discussed all different kinds of things about the singing, about the Gaelic, about the traditions. And he mentions the harp. He gives a little rundown of the history. And then after the 17th century and the, and the decline of the harp traditions, he says, from that day, the harp had been in disuse in the Highlands. And though far from being a powerful instrument, its study has again been revived, and a yearly prize is offered at the mod to the best performer on this ancient instrument, called by the Highlanders the Clarsach. It is held on the knee and is of the shape of Queen Mary's harp. The ancient instrument, with a little care and rearrangement in the <coughs> mode of stringing, can easily once again become one of the national instruments of Scotland. At the present moment, it is pronounced crude. But, crude though it be, it was delightful to see its use revived. And this, this is an interesting little passage because it unfolds all kinds of cultural assumptions and preconceptions. And again, there's this little tag about the stringing of it. So Kate MacDonald's harp is just like mine. It's an archaeological copy of the medieval instruments. It has brass wire strings. And Archibald Campbell says, with a little care and rearrangement in the mode of stringing. In other words, they don't really know what to do with it. It doesn't really work when you play it with an Anglo-Continental pedal harp technique. Therefore, you change the instrument. Because nobody was thinking at this time of changing technique. And so within a year, the whole project of commissioning archaeological replicas of the medieval harps for the revival had kind of ground to a halt. And instead, they sent to London pedal harp maker. But they said, we don't want London pedal harps because they're too big and classical looking. Can you make us an Anglo-Continental pedal harp shrunk that looks kind of medieval? And this is what they came up with. So, so it's styled after the Queen Mary harp. You can see that it has the decorative carving and the fish and the roundels on the front part. And yet structurally and technically, it's basically a pedal harp. It has a single action mechanism at the top that's hand operated. This is the same kind of thing that John Egan was doing 80 years before in Dublin. And so here's Amy Murray, and she's sitting with her harp very high. I think, th I think there's a cello spike in the base of the harp that sticks down onto the ground to, kind of, to, to make it floor, because the harp should be floor standing, not resting on your knee. It's not, it's not stable and coherent. I'm standing at the table to play that one because it has to rest on something. And I could sit on the floor and then you wouldn't be able to see me. Um, so she has it high, so she's playing it like the treble range of a pedal harp. She has the Anglo-Continental hand position and the orientation. And she's playing a chordal accompaniment to her singing. Same kind of thing that Sophia Lockhart and Margaret McLean Clefane was doing. And I have a news cutting here from the Scotsman in 1895. And Lord Archibald Campbell again was um, president of the Highland Society of London. And he hosted a lecture by... Mr. MacDonald, who was some kind of instrument maker or inventor, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure who he was, I've not found him yet, on the history and antiquity of the harp. And MacDonald says, he, he, gave, he gave this whole thing about the history of the harp, Ossian, ancient traditions. He says, the modern double action harp, that is, the pedal harp, the modern duck double action harp was the only instrument which could now be successfully encouraged. It was the perfect development of the old Celtic harp, as the pianoforte was that of the spinet or dulcimer. 
not only could all the ancient Highland melodies be rendered upon it with ten times more facility than on the old instrument, but it was preeminently a most capable instrument, both for solos and accompaniments. And then he says, the failure of the various efforts made in Ireland to reinstate the harp could only be attributed to the non-adoption of the modern instrument, probably owing to the price of it being pro prohibitively expensive. He anticipated, however, that soon it would be as cheap as a sewing machine or a typewriter. So he has this vision that pedal harps could be mass-produced, that they could be put, put on the mass market, and that everybody in Scotland and presumably Ireland as well, though he was not so bothered by that, would ha be able to have access to pedal harps, use it for playing the ancient harp music, just like Sophia Lockhart and Margaret McLean for fame were doing, but they could afford expensive pedal harps. You see what I mean? So he has no time at all for this kind of thing. But what happens is that that doesn't happen. There's never a mass take up of pedal harp in Scottish tradition. There is in Wales but not in Scotland and not in Ireland. Instead, these kind of things get developed. So it's not a full-size pedal harp, but it works like the treble end of one. And that's how you make it as cheap as a typewriter, not by mass production, but by miniaturization. And this basic idea has, has grown and carried on to the present day. And this, this kind of thing, gut strings, set up in the Anglo-Continental tradition and played in, in that style is the mainstream of harp playing in Scotland and <coughs> Ireland today. Here's Patuffa Kennedy Fraser with her mother Marjorie Kennedy Fraser. They were very important and influential in the development of Gaelic music um, Marjorie went and collected tunes out in the Western Isles and then published them in piano arrangements and they're very popular um, less so nowadays because people because they're, they're rather dated but you know they're, they're kind of classical compositions in the style of Bartok or whoever and if they weren't if they, if they were based on something else not on Gaelic songs in the West Highlands, people would admire them as interesting national classical music, but because they're Celtic, they get put in the folk music box and then re regarded as failed folk music rather than as successful national classical music. So that's another interesting thread that you could follow up on, but we haven't got time to. This is, this is a little booklet that Patafa made of harp arrangements of these tunes, which I find very interesting because this is much more unusual than the piano arrangements. And here's the tougher with her harp. And she says, the small Celtic harp, or classa, as modelled today by Morley, who are an English harp maker, although not provided with the modern pedal system of the full-size concert harp, which gives ease and rapidity of modulation, is yet amply sufficient in range of keys and scales to meet the needs of most folk song accompaniments. And again, this is a fascinating little passage because it packages up all kinds of cultural assumptions. First, that you have to defend yourself against why you're not as good as a pedal harp. To the, so the implicit assumption that the pedal harp is the norm that you look up to. And second of all, that, it's, that, that she's talking about folk song accompaniment. So this presenting of Gaelic, the Gaelic tradition from the Western Isles as folk song, which is very contentious. And it's not necessarily folk song at all. You know, that's a, it's this whole dividing the world into folk and classical, which is very artificial and inappropriate for a lot of Scottish music. And Eloise Russell Ferguson um, <coughs> is a very neglected Scottish harpist, and I, and I put her up here because I think she's great. She, she started out playing Patafa Kennedy Fraser's Songs of the Hebrides arrangements, and then later in life she went to avant-garde and put out a series of records of well ahead of her time, sort of uh, modern stuff. And her biography has just been published by her niece, and it's on your bibliography, so that's worth reading for, for new insights into interesting angles on 
the heart tradition in the, through the mid-20th century. And in the 1930s, Henry Briggs was a very good violin maker in Glasgow, and he was asked to do harps. And because he was a violin maker, uh, and a good one, he took it from first principles and redesigned the structure and the crafting of the harps. And so his improvements are still with us today. And so Alison Kinnaird, for example, she got one of his harps as an antique in the 80s, and she still plays it today. And so Briggs is an important person in just kind of tightening up the parameters of what a Scottish harp is. In that Anglo-Continental gut-strung right orientation, mechanized, single action, semitone mechanism tradition. And like I say, this is the, now the mainstream of harp playing in Scotland. There's far more of this kind of harp than there is of pedal harps or of medieval harps or anything else. Okay. I couldn't quantify it, but I guess 90% of harping in Scotland is on this kind of instrument. Here's Alison again, but in this picture, she's playing the instrument that I've shown you on the right from the Maker's Brochure. And if you look at the bottom of the Maker's Brochure, Robert Evans, historical harps. And so this is a whole new angle of things in the 20th century is the idea of historical music, early music basically, which started in the classical tradition with harpsichords and lutes and recorders. And that idea has been picked up in the harp world. And so Robert Evans was making historical Irish and Scottish harps. And he made this one for Alison. And so she plays it as, as a historical harp. It's a copy of the Lamont harp that we saw in Gunn's book. And so then you have this whole thing, you have the brass wire strings. And in the early music idea with harpsichord and lute, it's no longer acceptable to say, oh, well, this doesn't really work with my modern classical technique, therefore change the instrument. Instead, you have to change your technique to learn how to play the historical instrument. And so that's a new strand in the 20th century of taking the medieval harps at face value and, and learning a new technique or trying to rediscover an old technique to be able to play them. Okay? So this is the opposite way around from what happened in the 1890s with the with the reproduction medieval harps, where they just gave up on them and switched to miniature single action pedal harps. You'll see that Alison is still playing in the classical orientation, and this, is, this, is, this interests me as a practitioner of the historical approach, why people choose the right classical orientation or the left indigenous orientation. And there, it's a complicated subject, but it's, it's a study in its own right. But you can see that, anyway, you can see that Alison is taking her big reproduction medieval heart very seriously. She's recorded on it, historical music, playing with historical playing techniques. <coughs> and there's a number of other people that have, that, that have done the same kind of work that Alison's done. Anne Heyman in America was the pioneer who, who got Alison started and who got me started. And there are other people doing this work with the historical hearts, trying to reconstruct the historical tradition. And there's a kind of continuum. So some people are very strict and ignore the modern revival tradition because it's too Anglo-Continental. And there are other people who basically come out of it and do a kind of in-between fusion. So it's not really easy to divide these two things in half. <coughs> that historical approach requires reproductions of the old instruments like I've got here, which is a copy from the Queen Mary harp in the museum. So, and then you have to go to the museum and you have to study the old instruments because the more you study them, the more you learn about the old instruments, the better your historical reconstruction can be, the more strictly you have to adhere to the historical technique and the more different the sounds and the idea, musical ideas that you get from the received tradition, the received revival tradition, you see. So Karen Loomis um, did her PhD at Edinburgh University a few years ago, and she got access to the two harps in the museum, and she took them to the research hospital. And so here's the Queen Mary harp, 
going through the, the CT scanning machine. And on the screen there, you can see the cross sections and everything of it. And this is the kind of this is the kind of data that she's publishing. So this is a cross section of the real Queen Mary half, which I a replica of. And you can see all the interior detail of how it's made. Okay? And I've made use of this data because my replica was commissioned before she did her studies. But since she did her studies, we discovered new things, like things like the internal structure. And so especially the, the way that the, it's quite open at this left-hand end of the sandbox. And so I took my heart to a heart maker and had them cut it, recut the wood on the inside to copy the internal shapes that you see in the scans. And this opens up the voice of the heart, it changes the balance of treble and bass, and that affects my musical practice on it. So there's a feedback between this organological research and the historical performance practice work, which, is, which I find very interesting. And it kind of develops that side of the tradition in new ways. Another aspect of historical, the historical heart side of things is that you, that you can do work in archives finding evidence for what the repertory was. And so this is a little, this is, this is a, a lute book from the early 17th century, from the 1620s, and it contains a tune that is said in later tradition to be a harp tune. So I thought I'd play you a little bit of this on the replica harp so that you can get a sense of this work. That once you've got the replica harp up and running, you can start looking for repertory and thinking about historical style and technique. So I'll play you this early 17th century lute setting. And the, and the setting gives us the bass, it gives us the harmonies, it gives us the ornaments. So you can play it pretty much as written, and you get a very different sound world 
And then you can have the whole thing that you can then study the history of the harp in Scotland as a historical subject. There's an interesting thing that people get so hooked up in the historical performance practice method that they always think that you have to do what you see in the historical sources. And of course that's not true at all. You can study history as a standalone thing. And um, this is the beginning of harp history in Scotland because there are the picture stones that have triangular stripy things on them. And I think it's kind of interesting that this is the world of art history. This is not the world of musical performance. There's nothing you can say about these pictures from an organological or musical point of view. They're just triangular stripy objects on the knee of King David and you have to discuss them in terms of the David cycle of iconography and sitting on a chair and who the other characters on the cross are. You can look at the West Highland grave slabs that have harps pictured on them and you can talk about cultural context, you can talk about um, the aristocratic learned culture of the bards and the poets and the chiefs and the hunts and the church and symbols of authority and all this kind of thing. There's an inscription on the right hand gravestone but nobody's really been able to read it properly so it tells us something about the people but you have the instruments themselves you can talk about cultural connections so on the right is the Queen Mary harp that you know and love on the left is the Trinity College harp which is the national symbol of Ireland and you can see that they're basically the same and so this is very interesting why are they the same some Scottish scholars have suggested that the Trinity College harp was made in Scotland which the Irish scholars are not very happy with but I don't think, I think they're over-egging it. Um, but there's a really interesting comparison you can make between these two instruments. The Queen Mary harp has been radiocarbon dated, but the results are not out yet. The Trinity College harp has not. It hasn't been put through a CAT scanner or anything like that. So there's questions about how they relate to each other, questions about the, how much information we have. There's a lot of hearsay and repeating of old information about, about this subject. It's not on a solid as scholarly footing as it should be. Um, there's the whole history of interaction between Ireland and Scotland that I've not really touched on. Uh, this is Dennis O'Hampsey, who was one of the last of the old Irish harpers in the 1790s. All his music was written down by Edward Bunting, the pioneering ethnomusicologist and field collector. And when Dennis O'Hampsey was young, he toured in Scotland. He was in Edinburgh in 1745, and he played for Prince Charles Edward Stuart. And so this... Irish harpers touring in Scotland, Scottish harpers going to Ireland to learn to play. There's a lot of connections. The, so the Irish and Scottish harp traditions are one unified Gaelic harp tradition, maybe. There are edges that are, that are disconnected. There are, there are separations and connections. It's very sim subtle and complicated. But this is Anne Heyman, who is my harp mentor. She started in the 1970s, and nobody else was working on the historical method. And this is her with Dennis and Hampsey's harp, so it's just so that you can see his harp is much bigger. So there's change over time. The tradition is not static. Patrick Byrne was one of the very last of the old Irish harpers in the 1850s. 18, he, he died in the six, 1860s, I think. Um, he was in Edinburgh in 1845 and had his photograph taken. And so it's the first photograph of a traditional musician. And there he is with his really big Irish harp. And there's an example of another one in the Cambridge Museum. These old men were the last tradition bearers. They did not have students. They didn't pass the tradition on. So anything that happens after that is a revival and is not connected to the old tradition. And this is the reason for bringing in the Anglo-Continental stuff. And so one of the things that's interesting is the Anglo-Continental stuff was being brought in even while these guys were still going. So Eloa and Sophia Lockhart, you know, they were they were they were on the go before Patrick Brown was even born. But there wasn't an interchange between them. They didn't take his tradition. They ignored his tradition and they brought in the Anglo-Continental tradition. And you can see that because of the orientation is the is the number one key. 
thing, but there's lots of other things about it, the metal strings, the style of the music, the style of playing. That's it. I don't think we have, we have time for half a question, if anyone's desperate to ask something. There's lots of subtle clues, so you can look at manuscripts that show what notes you play, and then you can work out well, how do you physically play those notes with your hand. There's wear marks on the harps. There's descriptions. There are, especially from the Irish side of the tradition, there's a there's a list of playing techniques that tells you what finger is on what string and. With, but like with the left hand, right hand thing, how do they even work that out? Pictures, and the, like I say, wear marks on the harp. So if you look at the Queen Mary's harp, you can't see it on this one. There's there's a lot of wear here and a lot of wear here. And so that's where you put your hands. You see what I mean? So this is the organological approach to using the instrument to work out what's possible, and then the manuscripts approach to looking at original heart bases, looking at the notations of playing techniques. It's a lot of work. It's, it's like code breaking. Thank you very much. <laughs>